Well, good morning to each of you and a warm, happy Easter to you. I will begin with He is risen and you will begin with He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen risen indeed. I know for a number of you, this is already your second service of the day. You joined in an early sunrise service either at Shawnee Inn or on Hindstone Hill. Just for the record, if that is the case, you do not get credit for next week's service. So we're assuming that you'll be back worshiping with us. But we are so delighted to be able to welcome you here. We're so thankful to Tuscarora for allowing us the use of the space. And of course, to be able to gather as one congregation with, I know, families and friends from all sorts of different directions is indeed a privilege um, uh, for us to have. And so we don't take it lightly and trust that as we've gathered in Jesus' name, he is the one who will be honored and glorified here in the end. And that is who we've come to celebrate. Just a couple quick announcements about how the service works today. One, when we have the children's message in a little while, they'll come up onto the platform here behind me onto the risers. And then after that, pre-K through second grade is going to be dismissed to children's church. That's going to take place right across the parking lot to my right. There'll be some deacons and ushers there to show you where that is. They'll remain there until after the service. And parents, you do need to pick them up at the end. So afterwards, go over, pick them up, take them home. And you'll notice on your way out the door over there, there is a beautiful backdrop. If you'd like to have a picture with your family, you're all dialed up. You might as well not waste the moment. Take a picture, uh, share a picture, and enjoy the time together. And of course, we'll also gather the gymnasium afterwards for a time of refreshments if you're able to stay. As you make your way out of the auditorium, turn to the right and then work your way around through the breezeway and into the gym. And it'll be blessed to be together, catching up maybe with friends, family that you haven't seen in some time. Those are the logistics, know this. We are so delighted that you're here, and I bet you're delighted that other people are here as well. So why don't you stand to greet them, say hello, and then I'm going to turn it over to my uh, friends on the left, and they're going to lead us in song and worship.
has led Alleluia Following our exalted head chapter 24, verses 1 through 8. <clears throat> but on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you, while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. In Jesus' name. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope, with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested and my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace so free, washes all. She's all. 
Savior displayed on a criminal's cross. Darkness rejoiced as the heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in him. Welcome. You may be seated. It's so wonderful to see each one of you. I've been around the whole place here downstairs and even upstairs. It's pretty much full as well. So it's wonderful to see each one of you here as family and friends and, and uh, attenders of Mount Bethel Church here for this big celebration. And then there are a few of you out of this crowd of, I don't know, five, six hundred we've got here. There are a few of you that also braved the chilly temperatures up at Shawnee. And we had about 180 people worshiping up there at 6.30 this morning as well. So praise God for this special day of Easter Sunday. Let's bow together and just have a moment of prayer, shall we? Let's bow. Oh, Father, thank you that death was arrested on the cross. And new life began for so many of us who are in this room right now today. Every one of us that receives it, new life began through that cross. And especially it began because of this day that we celebrate today, Easter Sunday where you rose again from the dead, you burst out of the grave because nothing could hold you back. And because you rose again to newness of life, there is new life for us also in eternity and brand new life for us down here in earth as well as death is arrested and new life begins in each of our hearts and lives. Father, we just recognize that there's only one true and living God. You exist as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of all of our honor, praise, and worship as creator, sustainer, beginning and end of all things. We recognize Jesus Christ, our resurrected Lord, as the Messiah, the word who became flesh and dwelt among us. And we believe, Lord Jesus, that you came to destroy the works of our enemy, Satan, that you disarmed all the rulers and authorities. You made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through the cross that we just sang about. And we believe that you, God, have proven your love for each one of us here in this place, because when we were still sinners, you died for us, in our place on the cross. We believe that you have delivered us from the domain of darkness and you've transferred us into your kingdom of light and love and life that in Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of all of our sins. And we believe that we are now children of God on this Easter Sunday morning and seated with you here in the places here on earth. And we believe that we've been saved by the grace of God through childlike faith that is a free gift to each one of us and not a result of works that any one of us could ever boast about it. Lord, would you make us strong in you? Strengthen us in your might. May we not trust in ourselves. Would you put the armor of God around us, enable us to stand in that resurrection power and authority, that we'd have faith to resist the evil one. We know, Jesus, you have all authority in heaven and all authority on earth. You are head over all rule and authority. 
And therefore, you work in our hearts and our lives in a special way. And we know that apart from you, Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we can do absolutely nothing. So we declare our total, complete, and humbling dependence upon you. Would you abide and remain with us, not only in this service, but in the days ahead as you go with us? And would you do a fresh work in our lives that the truth of Jesus Christ, the truth of this Resurrection Sunday, would truly set us free? We ask all this. And now would you bless as we also worship you in one other way? As we bring our tithes and offerings, and as we offer those as you prompt us by your Holy Spirit, would you receive every bit of this offering unto yourself and use it for the outreach of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray it for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.
we invite you to stand and worship again with us. died upon the cross for us. You put our sin to death upon that cross that we might find eternal life in you and through you, God. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us this morning, that you would make your word plain upon our hearts, that your gospel would be proclaimed to us this morning. God, we thank you and we praise you. It's in your name we pray. 
Amen. You may be seated. At this time, the kids, we're inviting the kids to come up front. We'll give some special time to those who are up top to make their way down the back. There's the stairs on either side. This This is always our favorite, well, one of our favorite times, seeing the young ones come up here. And as they are making their way up, again, just a note, uh, the the young ones, pre-K through second grade, are going to be dismissed over to Children's Church, and then you can pick them up afterwards at the building right across the hallway or across the parking lot there. And then also you'll see flowers up here on the stage. If you would like to purchase those and take home with you after the service, Rachel will be up here and will be glad to take anything that you can give towards them. And we're just so delighted that we're able to have the service adorned with them here this morning. Can you give a special thanks to all the people who are helping, the food afterwards, the choir, the praise team, uh, the children's church people. All right, are we here? Yes, almost everybody's here. I love it. All right, well, you guys know, I hope, how many of you have been here before? Raise your hand if you've been here before. Yes, lots of you have been here before. So you know at Easter time we always do something special. And usually we play a game called, who wants to tell me what the game is called? Yes. What's in the bag, right? That's usually what we play. But what did you say? Oh, yeah. This year it's a different twist. I can't hear you. You you need a microphone. I bet your parents say that too, right? You need a microphone. Yeah. We're going to play instead of what's in the bag. I have, I have an egg. And just so you guys know, I had to travel all the way to distant parts of Africa to find a bird that was big enough to give me an egg this big. So we have to be very, very careful with this egg. And it's a very special color, right? But believe it or not, firstly, I was teasing. It's not a real egg. It's a plastic egg. But inside the egg, there's something. And I want you to try to guess what that something is. So the way this game is going to work is I'm going to give you some clues And after each clue, you're in seventh grade. Interesting. They don't want to give it up. After some clues, you're going to guess. You're going to guess what's in here, okay? So here comes clue number one. And this one, this one's going to be hard. What's What's in the egg is something that comes in multiple pieces that must be put together. Multiple pieces that must be put. I, uh, multiple pieces. My people think, let's, uh, let's see. Okay, we have some very nice hand holders. Yes, what do you think? I think a puzzle. A puzzle. How many people think it's a puzzle? Isn't that a really good guess? Yes, multiple pieces that have to be put together. You think it's a puzzle? Here's what I'm going to tell you. You are wrong. Wrong. Clue number two. Clue number two. It's made out of something that you might find in a forest. It's made out of something that you might find in a forest. Okay, so multiple pieces have to be put together. Made out of something you might find in a forest. What do you think? Legos. Legos, that's a really good guess. But, yeah, because that's made of wood, right? And you have to put them together. That's a really good guess. Unfortunately, it's not correct. But it's a great guess. Does anybody else have another guess? Is that what you thought it was too? Yes. Aha, she was right. What do you think it is? Blocks. Oh, sorry. Blocks. That's also a good guess, but incorrect. Yes, one more guess. What do you think? Yeah, what do you think? Did you forget? Chocolate. You think chocolate? I think Mm, uh, yes, one more guess. What do you think? Blocks? Oh, rocks. Oh, yeah, that, you could find those in a forest, right? It's, it's not any of those things. So those are really good guesses. And it, just so you know, it's not even chocolate either, but I wish it was. Okay, last clue, number three. Number three. Comes in multiple pieces. You have to put it together. Piece number two, you might you find it in the, in, the, in the forest, right? Clue number three. There is another one somewhere in this room. There's another one somewhere in this room. Somewhere in this room, there's another one. Yes, what do you think? A goat? Close, but no, no, that's not. That's a really good guess. Yes, what do you think, Miss Lily? Flowers. Flowers, that's a good guess. That's not it either. 
Hmm, yes. A plant? A plant, good guess. Not quite it. Tape? Tape? That's not it quite it either. Wait, I will tell you that, last clue, last clue, what? the thing that it's similar to is, this will challenge you, to your right. Daddy, to your I'm other right. right. There we go. What do you see over there that maybe is something that comes in multiple pieces that has to be put together, made out of something that you might find in the forest, and what was the third clue? In this room. Do you know? A cross. Look at that. If I twist this off, it's stuck. I couldn't get it together beforehand. And there it is, right? Inside the egg, two pieces of wood have to be put together. What would you find in a forest? You'd find wood trees, right? It's somewhere else in this room, right over there to the right-hand side. And somehow I was able to find, find one small enough to be able to fit in a super egg, right? And you might say to yourself, well, that actually makes really good sense. But the reason that I want to bring this up today, and this is what I'm going to talk with your parents about in a little while, is this. At Easter time, at Easter time, so often we think about a tomb, and we think about a tomb being empty, right? Because that's where Jesus was buried, and then he rose again. And it's so exciting to be able to think about what Jesus has done in rising again, right? But the thing about Easter is, particularly in the church, is that we never separate Easter from the cross. The two always go together. They always go together. Jesus rose again. That's absolutely true and absolutely worth celebrating. But he rose again because he first, he first died for us on the cross. And this is how Jesus begins this great work of drawing us unto himself. And I know sometimes it's hard. I mean, you guys are younger. You're smaller. Most of you, younger, smaller. And it may be hard to think about, boy, a cross is a difficult thing. A cross is a difficult thing. But here's what the Bible says, and it says it over and over again, that Jesus loved us so much, he loved you so much, that he was willing to die for you. He was willing to die for you so that you could have life, resurrection life with him. So when you begin to think about it, and you continue to grow up, and you say, huh, what's this Easter thing all about? Well, you would say, yes, it is about Jesus rising again, isn't it? But it's also because he died first on the cross for you and for me. The two have to go together. He dies first, and then he rises to new life for you and for me. And the egg the eggs that we decorate and that we hide, those are just side kind of things. This is where the real stuff is at during, Christmas, or during Easter, okay? Boys and girls, I hope you know how thankful we are that you are here. If you're in pre-K to second grade, you're going to go with Mrs. B right out that door over there to Children's Church. There might be some other ones who didn't come up here going to Children's Church. They will make their way to that side. If you're older than that, and there might be some of you who are that, if you're not going to Children's Church, then you go right back to your parents, okay? Thank you guys for coming up here. Good job. Wow, isn't it wonderful to see all the kids and our famous state trooper carrying his son down there? He, he needed security up there, so the state trooper came with him. What a, isn't it beautiful to see all the kids up here? What a blessing it is. And uh, just so you know what's going on here, I'm stalling a little bit until we get a penis. I could probably sing it without a penis, but see, all the kids have to get down that way before the penis can come up that way. Bob, why don't you just jump up on the stage? I think you could do that. <laughs> what a wonderful day it is, is it not? And we're going to sing two songs. Christ arose, that's the one that starts, starts out, low in the grave he lay, Christ arose. And then we're going to sing about really a testimony song, I serve a risen Savior, he lives, he lives. So first song is, Christ arose, low, I think we've got to stand up for this. That way you'll be able to stay awake through the whole message, right Chris? Isn't that how it works? Low in the grave he lay. Jesus. 
same song out in about 38 degree weather up at Shawnee this morning. It was easier to sing in this warmer weather. I can't figure out why that was, but it was. And you sang it so wonderfully. You lifted the roof off here. This next song is really a testimony. Sing it from your heart. I serve a risen Savior. He lives and lives and walks with me and talks with me. Sing it as a testimony unto our risen Lord. I serve a risen Savior, He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever men may say. I see His hand of mercy, I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He's always near. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus. Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. In all the world,
thank you that you live within our hearts. And Lord, if there's even one, if there's even one in here that does not have you living in the heart yet, thank you that we believe through the power of your word, faith comes from hearing from your word, and faith will come into the hearts of those who need that faith. We trust you for that. We ask you for that. Bless now as we hear the message in Jesus' name. Amen. We mention this a lot, I think anyway, but when you join in song and lift your voices up together, it makes such a difference. And I know sometimes it can be hard to do in a bigger auditorium like this, surrounded by people, maybe you don't have the best voice. God kind of works that out, doesn't he? As we just lift our songs up to him and trust uh, that the chorus of God's people together uh, is what it should be. And the choir is singing a song unto our king that he deserves this morning, of course, we are considering, as we always do on Easter Sunday, uh, the various resurrection texts, the passages of Scripture that talk about the res resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if you listened closely to Lewis's words a little while ago, words that he read out of Luke chapter 24, uh, you might remember a certain phrase in there that as the people arrived at the tomb, they were a bit bewildered at what had happened because they had yet come to recognize that Jesus must suffer, die, and be raised again. They had yet to come to realize that Jesus must suffer, he must die, and must be raised again. They just didn't get it yet. If you were to go home and read through John's gospel, you would find something similar, that as Mary came to the tomb that morning and the disciples joined them in the process, they too didn't understand, and this is how John words it, they didn't understand that Jesus had to rise again. It was a matter of absolute necessity. The resurrection of Jesus Christ was a matter of absolute necessity. And if you've been with us for a while, and I know there's visitors here, you come from far distances to be with your families, you don't know uh, that over the last number of weeks, all the way through the Lenten season, we have been dealing with this very theme, the necessities of Jesus, the divine necessities. Things that Jesus said at various times in his ministry that he absolutely had to do. We talked about Jesus in the upper room with Peter and the disciples, and he washes their feet, and he says, I must wash you, or you have no part with me. When he was with Peter, after Peter makes the astounding declaration that you are the Christ in Mark chapter 8, the Son of God, Jesus says, the Son of Man must suffer. He must die, and hand it over to the chief priest, suffer, die, and on the third day rise again. There it is. These different places in the Gospels where Jesus declared there are certain things that just must happen. They are a matter of divine necessity. But part of the question that we want to wrestle with this morning is why? Why were they matters of divine necessity? And if we're going to understand that, and this will be a little bit redundant for some of you, but that's okay. If we're going to understand a matter of necessity, what we have to realize is that a necessity is a necessity, and we talked this, about this before, because of the necessity's centrality to the mission of God. In other words, a necessity is a, ne is a necessity because whatever it is that is a necessity is necessary for accomplishing the mission that one is about to, to accomplish. Now, if that makes sense, let me give you an example. And it's a little bit of a weird example. It's a personal example. And you might be like, why in the world is he telling this story? I'm only telling this story as a matter of establishing what it is that we're talking about. And here's how the story goes. A couple of weeks ago, uh, it was one of the nights that I drew the short straw and I needed to make dinner. And so, it, believe me, it's a short straw, a very short straw. So I looked through these recipes and I texted Susie, or Susie and Addie and I said, here's what we're going to have. You're going to love this. We're going to have cilantro shrimp in romaine lettuce wraps. Doesn't that sound, I mean, if you don't like shrimp, it probably sounds horrible. But if you, if you like, like seafood, so you can, don't look it up now, please. I don't want, <laughs> don't look it up. But when you get home, you can see cilantro shrimp in romaine wraps. I'm like, how does this sound? Sounds great. Sounds great. Okay. 
So I go home after work, long day at the office, go home after, <laughs> I, got, I got to deal with people like you all the time, long day at the office. <laughs> just kidding. I'm just, so I go home, I go home, I open up the freezer drawer, I have 10 shrimp. <laughs> 10, 10, that's it, 10 to feed three of us. And if you, does anybody, they're medium. Does that, like, <laughs> so I'm like, oh man, this is going to be a problem. So then I, I raise my eyes a little bit and I open up the fridge and I open up the, the whatever, the, the produce drawer. I have no lettuce. <laughs> I have no lettuce. So I have 10 shrimp and no lettuce to be able to make cilantro shrimp in romaine lettuce wraps. Now, you're asking yourself, again, what does this have to do with anything? Here's what I'll tell you. That both shrimp and romaine lettuce are necessary to be able to make cilantro shrimp in romaine lettuce wrap. They're both necessary. Now, if I ask you, just randomly, I came up to you on the street and I said to you, hey, is shrimp necessary? You'd be like, no. I can easily live without shrimp. I said, well, what about this? Is romaine lettuce necessary? Again, you probably, most of you could go the rest of your lives without touching a piece of romaine and be just fine, wouldn't you? I mean, seriously. So when I ask you the question, is romaine lettuce necessary? You go, well... No. And if I said, is shrimp necessary? You'd say the same thing. No, shrimp's not necessary. In fact, some of you would probably live better without shrimp. It's not necessary. If we're talking about big things in life. But if we're talking about my mission on that night to make cilantro shrimp in romaine lettuce wraps, they are absolutely necessary. Does that make sense? I couldn't do it without those two ingredients. They were necessary. They were necessary, right? When we begin to think about divine necessity, the things that are necessary for Jesus, there's a number of people who say, well, what Jesus did wasn't really necessary. Like if you're on the outside, maybe outside looking into Christian faith, maybe skeptical, you go, yeah, he died. He died. Everybody dies. Rise again. Oh, I don't know about that. Necessary for your life? Probably not, right? You're living just fine without it. But if you understand it rightly, what it is is that you've, you've come to this place of recognizing or believing this is what life is. And in the matter of living out that life, you say there's certain things that are necessary and there's certain things that aren't. And they're necessary, they're necessary only to be able to achieve what you desire to achieve in, uh, to achieve in life. You watch the stock market go down, you go, oh man, I need that to be higher. Do you need it? No. You want it to be higher. You need it to be higher in order to achieve what you desire to achieve through that given thing. And you could go through all sorts of different parts of life and say, you know what? There's a lot of things that I say are, I need. Are they need in the grand scheme? No. They're need in the minor, thing, minor scheme. They're, they're, they're needs according to what you're trying to accomplish. That's what they are. And so the question is, how does this work for Jesus? If we're going to say together, collectively, that, that Easter, this whole story and this whole series that we've done on divine necessities are things that are necessary for Jesus to accomplish his, his mission. In other words, the necessity is a necessity because of its centrality to the mission of Jesus. It's important to begin to understand, well, what is the mission of Jesus? What was his mission? What was his, what was his life ultimately all about? And I would bet that if we were to do a poll of you, the congregation gathered here and, and the millions who are joining us online, good morning to you, by the way, and you were to write it down and turn it into me, I bet we would get a lot of different answers. What was Jesus' life all about? What was it all about? Some people might probably write down, you know what it was. Jesus' life was to, to provide us an example of what life is supposed to look like. You kind of be right, right? Well, that's kind of right, kind of in part. Uh, you might you might write um, uh, that Jesus came to be able to forgive sins. That would that would be right, wouldn't it? That be that be right. But is there more to it than that? Did Jesus come to be more than an example? Did Jesus come to be more than a forgiver? And I think if we understand this rightly, we can conclude, and I think appropriately so, we can conclude this, that there, those things are important, but there's also more to it than that. 
that if I understand the movement of Jesus, the direction of his life, the, the mission that he was all about, here's what I know, is that Jesus did come to forgive sins. There is no doubt about that. In the process of doing that, and he said it with his disciples at the, at the, last, at the foot washing in John chapter 13, as I have done for you, so go doing for one another. So there's an example, right, of what his life was supposed to be like. But can we also add this? The part of what Jesus came to do, yes, to give us an example, yes, to forgive sins, but, but ultimately, isn't, that, isn't it that we might have a, a, a united, a reunited relationship with our Heavenly Father? That we might be able to dwell with Him, not just for a short time, but for all time? That we might be able to receive the gift of eternal life and what God offers us through the forgiveness of sins? That's what Jesus is all about, isn't it? Showing us, yes, forgiving us, yes, reuniting us with the Father, all of those, all of those are part and parcel to the mission and ministry of Jesus. That's what he was all about, which means, and this is why this is all important. I hope you're, are you, can you raise your hand if you're tracking with me? I just want to make sure. Okay, 17 of you, 17. <laughs> The reason this is so important because, is because if we're going to understand why things were necessary, why Jesus had to do what Jesus did, then I have to know what his life is all about. I have to know what his mission as the Son of God really was. And so when we begin to look at that, we can say to ourselves, okay, how does, how does Good Friday fit in? And then how does Easter Sunday fit in? And how does the resurrection fit in? And as we're looking at it today, why is the resurrection absolutely so necessary. And the reason I ask this, at least in part, why is the resurrection necessary, is because if we stop, and just follow this, you're going to really have to pay attention today. If we stop on Friday, if we stop on Friday, is that enough? I know some of you are going to shake your head. No, 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 no. Crazy. How do you get this job? Is it enough? But here's the thing. Here's the thing. If forgiveness of sins is enough, is forgiveness of sins offered on Good Friday? This is a hard question to wrestle with, and believe it or not, I wrestled with this a lot this week. Susie and I talked about it. I called a pastor friend of mine. I go, you got to help me with this. Sometimes pastors need other pastors to help too. But listen, what does Jesus say on the cross? Remember, as he, as he, as he hangs on the cross, as he's crucified for the sins of the world, Remember what he says? It is finished. Did Jesus just get it wrong? Did he forget, like, did we just not hear him say, kind of, <laughs> as he uttered and breathed his last? Like, it is finished. Don't let him know, just not yet. Right? No, it, it, it's finished. Well, what do you mean it's finished, Jesus? Well, what's finished is the price has been paid. The perfect life has been sacrificed. For while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Isn't that how it goes? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. This he gave, it's, it's this sacrificial sense of gifting someone. And if you begin to read through Scripture's pages, what you find is what we celebrate as people of God, as children of God, is the forgiveness of sins that was offered to us at his death, which is Friday. And so if his death happens on Friday, nobody doubts that's necessary, do you? No, nobody would doubt that. Why do we need Sunday? Why do we need Sunday? If Friday he finished the work, then why do we need Sunday? Why do we need somehow the resurrection to fit in? Well, here, here's what we know. That if you continue reading tonight, so you go home tonight and you continue to read through Luke's 24th chapter, what you're going to read about is the disciples who are on their way to Emmaus. Some of you will remember this, and if you were at the service this morning, I know I already mentioned it, but I'm allowed to. Here's the disciples walking from Jerusalem out to Emmaus. And what Scripture tells us is that they're so downhearted. They're discouraged. They're, they're, in some sense, if we add words to it, they're just defeated. 
And they're defeated because of what they've seen on Friday. This is Sunday, right? They're, they're defeated because of what they've seen on Friday. And they're saying to themselves, as Jesus kind of appears to them, they don't know it's Jesus, he just shows up. Jesus is like saying to them, what's the problem? Why, why are you so sad today? And they respond to him, are you, are you that ignorant? Were you not in Jerusalem? Did you not hear about Jesus? We thought, we thought he was the Messiah. We thought he was one who was going to come and redeem Israel to restore it to its place of prominence and significance. We thought that Jesus was the very Son of God. But now, but now, and this is, this is my addition, so I'm, I know, but now we just don't know. And maybe we could probably say, we just don't think so. On the basis of what they had seen, and on the basis of what they had witnessed, they said, I, don't, I just don't think, I just don't think that he's the Son of God. In other words, if we were to put this in different language, they just don't believe. They just don't believe in, in who Jesus was. They thought they did, but then everything got changed, and now they just don't know. Friends, think about how this works. Would you say, would you say, if someone, if someone came to you and they said, you know what, I just don't know whether Jesus' forgiveness is for me. I just don't know. What would you say? I hope you would say, well, we know that it is. Because Scripture tells us that Jesus came and he died for the sins of the world. It's for you. It's for you. And they would say, well, but, but what then next? What, what, what do I have to do? Because how do I know that it's mine? And what you would say is this, that the difference between what Jesus has done, uh, having been done in a, in a theoretical, objective sense, and, and, and what he's done for me, that his sacrifice counts for me, the difference is faith, isn't it? It's belief. It's being able to say that I recognize who Jesus is and I recognize what he's done and now it's mine and I'm able to receive it as unto myself. And it's that moment when faith happens from, or transfers from an outside external thing to an internal thing that it becomes effective. Do you understand that? So Jesus dies for the sins of the world. He dies for the sins of the world. Effective for the sins of the world, provided that it is received and accepted like a gift that's given from someone else unto me. So let me ask this. When does faith happen? When does, when does faith happen for the ones who are walking along the Emmaus Road, for the ones who are huddled in an upper room, for the ones who came to the tomb themselves and saw it on that Easter morning? Here's what I bet. If you talk to them on Friday, they are a disgruntled, depressed lot. They've all denied him, abandoned him, walked away from him. They want nothing to do with him. They're, they're, just, they're gone as it relates to Jesus. The Marys are saddened too. The disciples are on their way to Emmaus, bummed out because they thought, they just thought this is who he was, but now they just don't think so anymore. What makes the difference? What makes the difference? What, what moves them to the place where the finished work of Christ moves from just an external reality to an internal possession, something that I actually hold? What moves them to that place is in fact the resurrection, isn't it? It's the resurrection. It's, it's that moment when Jesus shows up in their lives and they're like, <laughs> it's you. It's you. You really are who you said you would be. You really are who God said you would be. The resurrection is important because it validates, it authenticates, number one, God's word, doesn't it? God said this must happen. He must suffer. He must die. He must rise again. God, if Jesus didn't rise again, would be a liar. He'd be a liar. He wouldn't be able to be trusted even a little bit. But even more than that, it establishes and gives a basis for faith. It gives a basis for faith. 
The resurrection is necessary because it opens our eyes to the reality that Jesus is who he says he is, that he did what he said he, he would do, that he was able to overcome the one thing that we're all facing, a sin, death, the devil, three things combined into one. Jesus overcame them all. And you say, well, how do you know? Because he's alive. Because he's alive. That's how I know. The resurrection is necessary because resurrection in that sense is a pathway for me to be able to believe what Jesus has actually done on my behalf. You see, it's one thing, it's one thing to be able to acknowledge his death. It's one thing to be able to say, yes, Jesus died, yes, Jesus crucified. It's one thing to be able to say that. It's another thing to be able to say that that Jesus died for me. And I believe it and I've received it by his grace, given to me through faith, given by his spirit, given by the risen Lord himself. The resurrection holds all of that in its power, doesn't it? And you might say, now, well, what, what, what benefit is that? How do I, what benefit is that to me? How do I move forward with this? Well, here's what we know, and this becomes powerful, is that when the, when the disciples were brought to the place of recognizing this Jesus, as their actual Lord and Messiah, the one who overcame death, who, who, who rose again in a victorious sense, you realize it became a determiner for all of life. That everything that they did, every direction that they moved, every uh, announcement they made was all because they knew they served a risen Christ. It enabled them to endure suffering. It enabled them to endure loss. It enabled them to write letters to churches who were undergoing and enduring the same. Recognize this. These light and momentary trials are giving way to an exceedingly great glory. How did they know that? Because they saw the risen Christ. They saw the risen Christ, and it literally changed their entire lives. And the question is then, does it do the same for us? That's a harder question, isn't it? Thomas, Thomas said, the disciples said, I, I won't believe until I see him with my own eyes. Jesus would come and say, Thomas, you believe because you saw. Blessed is the one who believes without seeing. Trusting, trusting that we are in fact serving together collectively, individually, a risen Lord, a risen Savior who calls us them to, then to follow him in every single part of our lives, in our homes, in our offices, in our relationships. He says, follow me, follow me, follow me. And you say, well, why would I follow you? Here's why, because he's victorious. Reigning over sin, reigning over darkness, reigning over death. If I don't follow him, what hope do I have? What hope do I have? Here, here's what hope I have. None. I have none. In the darkest days of life, I absolutely, have absolutely no hope if Jesus did not, in fact, rise again. No reason to gather, no reason to sing, no reason to get all dressed up, no reason to take pictures. I have nothing, I have nothing, unless Jesus rises. But he does rise, but he does. And because he rises, I then have everything. I have everything. And so, friends, what Easter does together is it brings us into this place where we're able to wrestle with this question. Has what Jesus has done in dying for the sins of the world, in overcoming darkness, and overcoming death, has it ever become mine, mine personally, in simple childlike faith, to say, God, that I believe, I believe that you have done this for me. And if you've done it for me, then I receive it with joy and joy in gladness. And you see, when people, God's people, turn to him, then we know Jesus' mission is complete. He rose again that you might believe, that I might believe, and in rising again and in belief, we might have life and have it to the full. Friends, realize this, and I finish with this, that, that it is a necessity and I know we talk about shrimp and romaine lettuce leaves at the beginning just as they apply to dinner. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is of fundamental importance for life. 
and all blame. And I pray that you're able to receive the gift that he desires to give even today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your heart and your willingness to come, to die in our place, to achieve the forgiveness of sins, and then offer that to us as your children. And Father, I know on the basis of the lives that we live, the things that we see, that sometimes it is very difficult to believe in you. And we acknowledge, even corporately today, that belief in you doesn't prevent difficulty or hardship or loss. It doesn't mean that we're not ever going to get sick. It doesn't mean that we're, ever, we're never not going to have financial troubles. It doesn't mean that our health isn't somehow going to give way. Our relationships are going to be tense at times. It doesn't mean any of that. What it means is that in every single one of those moments, there is hope. Because none of those things carry the final word. You do, as our Lord and as, as our Savior. And so, Father, I pray that even as we turn our hearts to you again in song and we're able to, to sing these words, I believe, I believe that what we sing is actually resonating with our hearts, that we do believe it, that we do believe it. And because we believe it, we have life and life in you. Continue to work faith in every single one with an earshot of these words today to the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ, who is our Lord. And together, God's people said, Amen. As we close our service this morning, we'd like to invite you to stand as we sing Because He Lives. Son, I believe in the risen one. I believe I overcome by the power of his blood. Amen. Amen.
Wow, it's wonderful, isn't it? How God holds our future in his hand. We praise God. God's been blessing, hasn't he? So we're going to close in prayer. And, you know, if the Holy Spirit's been speaking to your heart, the ushers told me there are over 700 people here. If God's been speaking in your heart, then you just pray along with us as we close together, no matter who you are, no matter what age you are. You pray together with us. Heavenly Father, thank you that you hold our future in your hand, and therefore we need not fear. But we're very human. We get filled with care and anxiety and fear. We know that ultimately comes from our sin nature. And the result of our sin is death or separation from you for all of eternity. But the free gift of God is eternal life through you, Jesus Christ, our resurrected Lord that we've heard so clearly and wonderfully about here today. So we just recognize that you are the only one and true living God and you exist as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You're worthy of all of our honor and worthy of praise as we've been singing to you this day. We worship you as our risen Lord and Savior. Jesus, we know that you are the Messiah. You are the Word who became flesh and lived here among us and lived a perfect life we couldn't live. We believe that you came to destroy the works of our enemy. You showed that by your resurrection from the dead. You displayed, disarmed all the authorities and rulers with a public display on the cross. And we believe that your love is for each one of us here. You've proven your love that while we were still sinners, you died for us and you rose again from the dead. And you want to deliver us from our own sin Deliver us from the domain of darkness and transfer us into your kingdom. Redemption through your blood, Jesus. And thank you that we know that by grace are we saved. Through simple childlike faith right in our hearts right now. A free gift of God, not a result of works on our part. So Lord Jesus, I confess my sin before you, my thoughts, attitudes, words, deeds, my omissions. I thank you for the blood of Jesus that cleanses from all sin. You tell me, that if I agree with you about it, if I confess my sin, you are faithful and just to forgive and purify, cleanse from all unrighteousness. Come into my heart. Do a fresh work. Resurrect that new life within me. Be with me as I go from this place and never leave me again. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Just before we sing this wonderful, uh, actually it'll be our doxology because he lives just the chorus of that couple quick announcements. Remember that there is there are wonderful refreshments here. If you can stay for a little while, I know it's Easter Sunday. Some of you may have plans, but if you don't, uh, head out these doors and upstairs as well. Go to my right, to your left. Go through the breezeway. It's the fastest way to get the serving going. Go this way towards the, the glass doors here and go through the breezeway into the gym. Those of you who are parents, remember that you have children, parents. You have children. And you can go out straight out the glass doors across to the building there, pick your children up. Uh, before the refreshments, that's probably a good idea. Then the workers can get over here too. One last thing I'm going to say, and they're right towards the front here. There's going to be a special day in our township, April 14th. What it is in a practical sense is electronics recycling. This is on a Sunday, by the way. After you come to church in one of the early services, from 1 o'clock till 4 o'clock at Chelsea Sun, which is uh, 487 Stone Church Drive right here in Mount Bethel, Chelsea Sun Bed and Breakfast. Bring your electronics, computers, keyboards, TVs, DVRs, old VCRs, microwaves, everything. Recycling is free. You just drop it off there and get rid of it. Isn't it great getting rid of that stuff? And then there will be an opportunity for a donation to Mark and Joanna right here. Mark and Stephanie, Joanna. Uh, Mark has been out of work since December. For years he's been dealing with some treatments and now it's chemo and uh, no work since December. So any offering given or donations given at that when you just drive through the Chelsea Sun is going to go to this family right here. And I encourage you, even if you don't have an old computer to get rid of, drive through there and give a donation anyway. This is on uh, Sunday, April 14th, between 1 and 4, and so there's, there's a thought. As long as we had a big audience here, I thought that was a good thing to say. Now, we want to do this, sing this great little chorus, and that'll be our benediction today, uh, our doxology, if you will. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Sing it out together. Because he Because he lives, all fear is.
Happy Easter, everyone.